Welcome to this presentation on the analysis of 2D elements, uh, in particular applying it to a heat transfer problem. We look at the uh, stiffness and load matrices, the development of those, and an example using ANSYS Mechanical to do a thermal analysis. All right, so to set up, uh, you can go to the lecture materials. Again, the link for that is in the notes below. Uh, grab the notes uh, for ANSYS of 2D uh, heat transfer problems. And you can also get this SOLIDWORKS uh, file, uh, chimney and heat sink parts. Uh, there's two parts in there that we're actually going to use, the chimney, uh, the concrete part, and the brick part. Uh, there's another one in there that um, uh, may or may not be used in a future example, um, but you'll get that. That's all in a zip file, so just unzip that and uh, you'll be ready to go. All right, so where are we going today in this lecture? We're going to look at the 2D governing equation for a uh, heat transfer problem, strictly conduction in this case. Uh, the formulation of this problem, how we would solve it using rectangular elements, and how we would do that with triangular elements. And then we'll do an ANSYS example to finish out. All right, so the modes of heat transfer, we have conduction, convection, and radiation. But when we're in a part, when we're in a fluid, there's always some form of conduction um, that's moving things about. And so that's what we're really going to focus in on this problem. Convection and radiation will come in with uh, boundary conditions. So we're going to focus in on the conduction here. So from Fourier's law, the heat transfer rate is defined by Q, or the heat transfer rate, uh, is equal to the conduction coefficient times the area times the temperature gradient you know, along some direction. So in this case, the x direction. And we also have it in the y direction, because at least for a 2D case, we're going to have this, both of these showing up. So the conduction and heat transfer rate in the x and y directions are represented by the lowercase q's. Uh, thermal conductivity of the medium is K. And cross-section area of the medium is A, and the temperature gradient, um, the del T del X and del T del Y, which I forgot to include here. All right. So the actual governing equation then for 2D steady-state conduction is this. So we have the conduction coefficient out front in the X direction times the second derivative of the temperature with respect to X, uh, plus the conduction coefficient in the Y direction times the second derivative of the temperature with respect to y, plus this new term that actually wasn't in the Fourier, um, Fourier's law of conduction, that's the heat generation per unit volume. So if a, if a volume that energy is flowing in and out of is actually generating heat, uh, then we would include that term. That's actually something we won't be looking at here, um, but would show up in the general equation. All right, the area disappears because uh, we divide through by the area and uh, goes to zero. So that's our steady state conduction equation. So looking at some various boundary conditions we could have with this equation, we could have constant surface temperature. Um, so usually this is due to a, a fluid phase change, such as uh, condensation or evaporation. And so there we set the temperature at some location, in this case, x equals zero would be equal to some constant value. We could have heat loss or gain at the surface be neglected, so some type of insulation, so the temperature gradient at that location, in this case x equals zero, that uh, gradient would be equal to zero, so that would represent no loss or gain from that location. A constant heat flux on a surface, so if we have looking at the conduction at that surface on one side, would be equal to a constant rate of heat flux. And a good example of this would be a burner on a stove is set to a constant heat flux. Right, heat loss of gain at the surface by convection, so the conduction into or out of the surface is going to be equal to the convection to or from that surface, so it's the temperature at that surface at x equals zero minus the temperature of the fluid. Give us that, uh, the overall heat transfer loss. Uh, heat loss or gain at the surface by radiation, could be another case, and uh, both conditions four and five, um, I've got the numbers, but this would be four for the uh, convection and five being the radiation. All right, so we can have any of those cases, but what we'll focus on here is convection as we go through. So linear rectangular elements, again, if you want a more um, kind of initial run through of this, this is in the previous presentation, which I'll leave a link for below uh, in the notes. But we're going to look at this linear rectangular element, uh, nodes I, J, M, and N in the X and Y direction locally. And you can see what the overall temperature profile might look like on, that, on a given element. All right, so the equation for nodal temperatures within a linear element is represented by the shape functions at each of those nodes times the temperature 
at each of those nodes. That will give us the overall temperature uh, of within the element. And those are the, those are the shape functions. Again, we developed this in the last lecture. Uh, shape function node I, J, M, and N. Right? And this is on a global coordinate basis. So the Glurkin approach says the uh, we uh, the idea here is we want to reduce the residual error uh, or the residual to zero, um, force it to be zero. Uh, the Glurkin uses an average with a weighting function the same form as the solution equation. So our weighting functions are are the shape functions. The shape functions are from our solution equation. So we'll have four of those, four residual equations. So we have the residual equation for node i using the shape function node i. And there's the governing equation. All right, we can differentiate or integrate that over the area. And that all needs to be equal to 0. So we'll do that for node j, m, and n as well. All right, so we're trying to apply our linear uh, solution here to our uh, governing equation. All right, so in matrix form, what we come up with is the transpose of the shape functions. If the shape functions is a row matrix, so it would be the transpose of that. Uh, times the governing equation, all that integrated over the area. All right, so we can separate this into three integrals, one for the conduction in the x direction, the conduction in the y direction, and then the heat generation term. And we could generalize this and set uh, C1 is equal to our Kx, C2 is equal to Ky, and C3 is equal to Q dot. And our phi our psi here is equal to uh, the temperature. All right, so we get our overall general equation now. So we got the transfer transpose of the shape functions times our uh, first term, second term, and then this was our generation term, some constant value there. Uh, so now I can apply to other problems, not just temperature, but have similar governing equations. And since we're integrating over an area up here, right, so dA, integrating over that area here, uh, we need to perform a very complicated double integral because we actually want to integrate in the respect to, in the y direction and the x direction. All right, so a little bit more is involved here in integrating over the area as opposed to just uh, a length in the previous case with 1D elements. All right, so the resulting stiffness matrix uh, that we come up with as a result of in doing uh, the Glurkin approach there is this. So the overall stiffness matrix for conduction is that C1 value that we had times the width over 6L, and then you can see what the values there in the matrix. Uh, then C2 times L over 6W with all those values there. So we got the length and the width of our rectangular element on its size. So then we substitute back in for C1 and C2, and as we do, we get uh, the Conduction in the x direction times the width divided by 6 uh, times the length, and we get the conduction in the y direction times the length divided by 6 times width, and the overall in the C to C inside these two matrices. So for any element that we have that has conduction through it, we'll use this equation to look at how the heat transfers through that element due to conduction. All right, so let's apply some boundary conditions. What do those look like? All right, so any convective boundary condition along different edges will contribute to the conductance matrix. So we've added in to the matrix we just came up with, with the two terms for x, conduction in the x direction and conduction in the y direction. It would add into those matrices, that contribution there. All right. So if we had convection here along the length uh, where we have nodes i and j, we would include this information because this is functionally, we have i, j, m, and n. And then if we went to um, the other possibility, we could have a convection along the side of the edge where J and M exist. So remember, the unit looks like this. We have I, J, M, and N here. So it would be along this side here. It would be this case. So we'd include these terms here. So we look I, J, M, and N. So we're just including those terms in the middle there. All right, uh, if we have M and M, so now we're up here on this edge here. So we're just going to include these values down here in the corner. And if we're at N and I on this edge over here, then we have just the ones in the corners of our matrix there. All right, so those are the contribution. If we have convection on that on the edge, we'd include one of these four uh, stiffness matrix into the conductance one. All right, for loading, 
The load matrices along the edges due to convection. So we have to include some load aspect because that's going to include the fluid temperature is going to show up. So again, if it happens on um, edge IJ, we'd include this one. For edge JM, we'd include this one. For edge MN, we'd include this one. And for edge L or NI, we'd include this one. All right, so you can include those in in the analysis to solve for the temperatures. Uh, if we had heat generation, so any heat generation within an element will contribute to the thermal load matrix for the element uh, with this. So we have the overall, here's the Q dot for that particular element times the area divided by four, and then we have a straight one column matrix here to uh, include a contribution of the heat generation to every node within that element. All right, and then we can put those together and just solve it out. So that's how we can solve for what's when you use the rectangular elements. So that's rectangular. So let's go look at linear triangular elements, a formulation we have here. So again, the overall setup here using global coordinates, we have I, J, and K. And then you can see a kind of representative temperature profile we can have on that. All right, so again, the equation for the nodal temperatures within a linear 2D rectangular element is the shape functions times the temperatures at each node, and we have the shape functions at node i, j, and k. Now the difficulty here is we have these extra alpha and beta terms, so we have to include all those. It gets a little bit more hairy, but I'm trying to simplify things as we uh, clump things together. Uh, again, using the Glurkin approach, so we can take the uh, transpose of the row matrix of the, whoops, of the um, shape functions and multiply that times our governing equation, integrating that over the area, in this case the triangular area. So the stiffness matrix for conduction comes out to be this. So we have the overall conductance matrix because of the conduction in the x direction and because of the conductance in the y direction, right, where area A is the face area of the element, the overall area of our triangular element. If we have convective boundary conditions along the different edges, so if we have for edge IJ, so we got a little triangle here, it's a little bit more straightforward here with the uh, triangle versus the rectangle, but I'll draw it up here anyway. All right, so for along this edge right here, this is what we'd apply, All right? Because again, here, if we go, we'd have I, J, and K. Oops, I, J, and K. So we'd include these two, or these four here for I, J, and K, for I and J. If we're on the J, K edge, so around this edge, we're gonna include just the ones down in this corner. And if we're at uh, the KI edge right here, we're going to include the ones up in the corners, two, three, and four. All right, so those will be added in to the conduction uh, conductive matrix, as we did with the rectangular element. For the load matrices, all right, so we got to uh, include that. We have the thermal loading here. So for, again, on ed I, edge IJ, if we have convection along that edge, all right, we'd add in this forcing function. If we're on the edge JK, we do this forcing function. Again, so if we look here on the side here, we got this I, J, K effectively. And so just I and J are included there. Here are just J and K, and then K and I here for the last one. All right, so depending on if convection's on that edge, we would include these terms. Now again, heat generation, you can imagine from what we had from the rectangular case. So we got our Q dot times the area divided by three, and we got it included at each node. All right, hopefully pretty straightforward. We're going to solve it the same way we did the rectangular element and finish that out.